Welcome back. And of course, so many excellent points being made by these members of parliament. This is uh, Mr. Danny Kruger, Member of Parliament for Devises, Champion of the People, in my view. Westminster Hall debate, Monday the 18th of December, yesterday. E-petition th- uh, 635940 relating to the International Health Regulations Amendments 2005 being proposed by the World Health Organization. And I'll leave you to uh, decide whether the term World Health Organization is a misnomer or not. Do let me know. Over to Mr. Kruger. Thank you, Mr. Kruger, and thank you for watching. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate, and my thanks to all the petitioners who've signed it, all the public who are interested in this, and uh, to the Honourable Member for Lancaster and Fleetwood for her introduction. It is somewhat concerning how few of us are present at the debate. I'm very proud always to act in concert with the you know, band, band of brothers here. Uh, we happy few uh, who uh, seem to fight on all, all, multiple fronts at the moment. Um, but, uh, but the fact is this is a fringe issue in Parliament and as, as demonstrated by the uh, empty benches and, um, and yet the public, significant numbers of the public do have a real interest in this topic. So what is going on? And I think the explanations are partly that it's a complex matter. Uh, it requires significant delving in pretty abstruse documentation and websites, and this debate goes on. It's not always that thrilling. It's also that we're debating issues of principle, which often fail to get traction in the media, the abstractions of sovereignty and individual rights, while um, occasionally generating headlines don't generate proper attention in, uh, in Parliament or in the media. But I think the fundamental reason why this topic and these uh, proposed regulations and the proposed treaty from the World Health Organization have not generated the sort of disquiet that we few members feel uh, among our <coughs> colleagues and f- among the, the wider public and the media is that we want, as individuals and as citizens, to trust in the government when it comes to health care. We really, really do. It's why we have such a commitment to the NHS in our country. We want the state to be trusted and authoritative and capable when it comes to our health. And we instinctively recoil at suggestions that there's a problem when it comes to management of health care. And yet, as as we've heard today from from my colleagues, put put the details very well, and I won't reiterate the points that have been made, there is clearly a difficulty and a challenge and a problem with the proposed regulations and the proposed treaty. It is suggested by the World Health Organization and by the governments that are contributing to uh, to the design of these regulations and this treaty that the World Health Organization moves from being an organization which is responsible for identifying on behalf of the countries of the world, identifying pandemics, moving towards actually coordinating and taking responsibility for coordinating the response to those uh, to, to pandemics. That is an enormously significant change from identifying to coordinating the response of nation states in how they manage their own health care. And we've heard uh, expressed very well the threats that that represents in terms of enforced mandates, enforced lockdowns and so on. And I would echo the uh, call on the Minister to address that specific question about whether the World Health Organization will be able to impose a lockdown or any other intervention without the consent of Parliament. I also would like him to reflect on the proposed, uh, the the clause in the proposed regulations that suggests that the World Health Organization would require countries to tackle misinformation and disinformation. And uh, De Maria, we must remember the World Health Organization, which is uh, aspiring to this power, is the organization which in January 2020 denied that there was human-to-human transmission of COVID-19. It also, for some months, uh, even longer, uh, for many months, uh, denied the possibility of a uh, human origin of the COVID-19 vaccine uh, um, pandemic, the virus, as having originated in the, uh, in the Wuhan facility. So this is the organization which we are proposing to give the power to intervene into national debates and close down discussion under the guise of misinformation and disinformation about both the origins and the appropriate responses to pandemics. 
And if we should have concern about, as we should, about the uh, value of the World Health Organization in future based on its, its record, I'm afraid we have to have the same skepticism about our own government's role because the trust in healthcare that we all desperately want to have, uh, I'm afraid, has been badly tested through the experience of recent years. And I echo many of the points, particularly by my uh, right honourable friend, the member for uh, Rayleigh and Whitford, thank you, um, just now about the sort of radicalisation that I think we, sh we, we both experienced through the cause of the COVID experience, from having started from a position of trust in government, trust in the state, to, to profound scepticism. And I just want to, if I may, Dame Maria, um, call attention to this new book which has come out, which I've contributed the afterword to. I, d I don't think I'd derive any benefit. We do advertising in here. Uh, okay. I won't, <laughs> forgive me if I don't. Well, I'm not going to advertise. And I derive no benefit from it, I should emphasize. But um, I, I have uh, contributed to the book. And it's written by the, by the, um, the uh, campaigners, Us For Them, who did such good work to call attention to the effect of the lockdowns on children. Uh, and again, became radicalized. Through the, through the experience, and they've written a very good book about the effect of the, about the, the lack of accountability in the COVID response. So while I, do, I, I, I don't share some of their, um, some of their uh, concerns about particular decisions made by particular officials or ministers, but I do share absolutely their concern about the failures of accountability of the system as a whole. And while the inquiry that we're all uh, watching uh, that's going on at the moment into the COVID uh, into the whole episode, is performing a fairly useful function, I think, in, in identifying sort of misdemeanors and confusions and in a sort of rather, you know, who done it way, identifying um, which ministers and officials and advisors um, deserve, um, deserve individual blame. I think what we're really getting out of that inquiry is the evidence that the system as a whole failed. There's no point, really, in my view, in identifying the culpability of individuals, when the fundamental problem that that inquiry, in fact, our, all of our experience demonstrates, is that the state, the British state, failed. And to the topic of today's discussion and these proposed regulations, and I made this point in the last debate we had in this place in April, the problem in the whole COVID uh, episode wasn't the lack of international cooperation. There was a very high degree of international cooperation, a remarkable degree of international cooperation. Almost every country did exactly the same thing, following China's example. What we didn't have enough of was independent decision-making at the nation-state level. And the bits that worked at the nation-state level at, at, was, was, was when on the ground, individuals and communities and local government and local public services and local businesses took initiative to collaborate, to, um, to develop their own responses, to take responsibility locally for supporting communities. And that's what we needed to see, I believe, at the national level too, more independent decision-making, while obviously collaborating and sharing information uh, about what works. So, Dame Maria, to, to conclude, I'm glad to hear, and I, I recognise the point made by the Honourable Member for, for Fleetwood and Lancaster at the beginning, and I'm sure the point will be echoed, I hope it will, by the Minister, that, we, that the government is committed to ensuring that UK British sovereignty is reflected, national sovereignty is reflected in the wording of any new treaty. But I'm afraid, and we're familiar with it from current debates, uh, that the peppering of the language of sovereignty uh, into legislation is not sufficient. What we really need is the, is the practice of sovereignty and the declaration of principles. Principles are only valid insofar as they are put into practice. And we want to see actual practice of the, of the principle of sovereignty in the, uh, in the treaty that emerges and in any uh, amendments to the regulations. So I'll, I'll conclude with these four questions for the Minister. I hope he'll be able to answer them. Firstly, when will we see a, the next uh, iteration of the draft regulations? I'd understood that they, would be, they were expected by now. When will we see them? Secondly, which minister, uh, whether it's him or, or a colleague, is actually responsible for negotiating the uh, treaty and the regulations? And, and, and I'm also interested to know which civil servants are involved. We knew who the civil servants negotiating Brexit were. I wonder who has been delegated to the, uh, to the WHO and is, and, and is working... Uh, on our behalf uh, there. Thirdly, the question has been raised by colleagues about the potential imposition of a very significant bill for the taxpayer in response to WHO mandates. Mm. Has work been done to quantify the potential uh, cost to the taxpayers of implementing the, recommendation, the, the requirements of the treaty? 
And finally, will the government commit, and I appreciate he's not in a position probably to do this today, but will the government commit to publishing its red lines, what it will accept and not accept? And I don't think just vague commitments to preserving sovereignty is sufficient. What exactly will be acceptable and not? And I appreciate the negotiations are going on in collaboration with other states, but I think it is appropriate for our government at this quite advanced stage of the negotiations to declare publicly what it is and what it's not prepared to cede yeah. in the way of our independence. Thank you.